Yep, now we can see. Perfect. So, I mean, so Oliver shared this paper with me. Because uh, I guess, how did you find it, Oliver? Like, why, how did you come up with it? Um, I, uh, I listened to a YouTube channel called Eye on AI. Uh, interview with uh, Jan Lacun. And it it's um it's interesting. I had heard Jan talk about these um world models as a potential mm-hmm. solution for uh, uh more efficient training and I just thought it was interesting. Yeah. 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 So this word I've actually uh, heard another author use. Uh so Jan Lacun definitely uses this and there's another author like um I actually covered his paper as well on another YouTube video and his, his point of view was like to drag progress in AI, you have to look at AI models through the lens of, again, world models and in terms of how much of the world can the AI understand. So they start off with uh, talking about the word to a paper and they say that... Talking the- about what? Oh. Talking about, they start off talking about what? Sorry? The word to X people. Have oh, word or glove or word to X. No, yeah. Oliver, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. So I said word to X. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Have you read any of those papers? Word to wipe or glove? No, I've heard of heard of word to back. Yeah, I've yeah. read so, the paper. Yeah. So, so I just complete my thought there, right? So that, so in the paper I was um, kind of I read before they talk about tracking progress of AI through word models and what glove and word to wipe did was, they are like tiny AI models compared to what we have right now with transformers and even IGF up, but the only concepts in the world they understand is antennas and semantics, right? So they are able to do uh, basically your, you train neural nets so that in the embedding space, these synonyms are close to each other and all the antonyms are um, almost arranged in a pattern so that the distance between, let's say, king or queen is, um, is similar to the distance between man and woman. So that's what the word to work and glove paper showed that uh, AI models can actually learn synonym relationships and antonym relationships. And then they talked about BERT, BERT having the capacity to do next word prediction, right? Uh, do translations. And um, what we have right now uh, with uh, LLMs is, you know, it's not just that AI understands the relationship between words, it just doesn't understand what the next word is supposed to be therefore in a way kind of complete the sentence the AI can also now you know you can even instruct the AI model so you can ask it to do something and it's not just completing your thought it's actually following it you know doing some thinking planning etc and all of this is possible because of again transformers architecture right the fact that you can pack a lot more layers together and unlike LSTM or RNNs you don't run into like diminishing gradient problem or other, you know, problems with scaling out an RNN or LSTM network. So now coming back to this, right? So I also went through the video once you shared with me and it appealed to me again, because I think I also feel like, I think tracking AI progress by thinking about how much of the world they understand, it's a nice way to understand progression, right? Because that's how you know an AI model is more advanced than the last one if it can uncover more of the world, right? And understand more of the world than the previous iteration. So, yeah, I'll give a quick brief on what was the major thesis I saw in the paper and maybe you guys can uh, give you a version. Um, So, iJEPA basically can be summarized uh, through this image and actually I'll jump a few slides because I like this image uh, a lot. So so in the iJEPA paper they talk about three architectures. The first architect architecture is the joint embedding architecture. Uh, this is a popular architecture where you take 
two samples from any set and then you embed them in some embedding space which is untrained, right? Uh, it has seen no training data. So you get some random embeddings and then you use the optimizer, could be SGD, Adam, any simple optimizer even. And you use the optimizer to kind of reorganize these embeddings such that the loss is minimized, right? And that's what the figure A kind of tells you that you're taking two inputs. Um, or, I mean, it could be an input response pair or it could be just like two inputs from the same topic or same sample set. And then once you move to the embedding space, it's trying to organizing the it's trying to organize the embedding space such that you know um, you can solve target tasks. So, for example, if you want the input and the response, uh, which are which could be synonyms, right? So, like um, kind of synonyms are like plants and trees, very much related. So, let's say if you have X as plant and Y as tree. The architecture A basically makes sure that in the embedding space, the embedding of tree and plant are pretty close to each other. Right? So this architecture can be used to again uh, learn synonyms, antonyms, relationships between inputs and responses or who inputs really well. Um, so this is an existing idea that they talk about in the paper. The second idea they talk about is this generative architecture which is what you have in, um, you know, in, in the diffusion model that's really popular right now to make images. Uh, what you kind of do over there is start off with a sample input, embed it in a space, combine it with a latent embedding, which is this. Um, and then you get take your input, take your latent embedding, and then run it through a decoder that generates a vector in the output space, right? the output space being Y. So, and in order to train this embedding space, the loss landscape basically takes as input your expected Y, and then the Y cap or the Y estimation you're getting from a combination of X and Z. So this is the generative architecture, the diffusion models fall into this, uh, auto encoders fall into this, uh, this, I mean, even in a way, GANs uh, fall into this. So these are the generative architectures and in the paper and even in the video, um, kind of my key takeaway from the paper is the novel idea that they bring in is um, do not train your embedding space. Um, in the, like if you train it, um, you know, if you train just in the embedding space, it's kind of, uh, um, yeah, if you train it in the embedding space without adding latent noise or latent input, you get decent results. If you train your embedding space by decoding the embedding and comparing it to the response, you also get decent results. But the real value comes in if you get the embedding, right? Um, get the latent input or some noise and predict, you know, and predict the embedding of your response. So here, the key difference between this and this is that X and Y both exist in the same embedding space, but here the Y encoder moves the Y response to the uh, embedding space represented by S. And instead of X also being directly represented as S, first, you know, X is in encoded in a separate embedding space. You combine it with Z and, you know, and then you kind of transform X into this new embedding space and calculate the loss, calculate the loss. So that's where this kind of the Jeffa acronym comes from is joint embedding idea from here because you again to have two encoders. And the predictive idea comes from the generator, which instead of you trying to generate the generate in the output space, you generate in a intermediate embedding space, and then you map your response also to that to that space instead of directly applying it to the loss function. So that's kind of my key takeaway. And I'll just take a pause here and see what you guys think.
Um, so one, I mean, one thing that they were saying with the generative architecture, you're, you're going directly from, you're trying to predict every pixel, right? Yeah. And with this, you're basically trying to predict a couple abstract representations and you'd have a separate model go from there to the pixel layer, right? Yep. And that's kind of the core difference. Yes, exactly. And um, you know, just to talk about an advantage of doing that is because this decoder will be much more lightweight or it will have fewer parameters than this predictor, right? Because the decoder needs to map to the output space, which for an image, right? It's like a 5 cross 12, cross 5 cross 12 embedding per channel, right? And you have four channels or three channels. But the predictor is mapping to a much smaller dimension, right? Maybe like a 5 12 cross 1 or 7 6 8 cross 1, which is what OpenAI gives, um, you know, um, in terms of like the chat GPT embeddings. So even if you're getting only 768, and that I would say the high bar for embedding. Your predictor can be much lightweight, possibly can be trained on lesser data, more energy efficient, and you know, all those advantages. Yeah. Makes sense. <clears throat> um, would you mind going over the generative architecture a little more? this uh yeah i'm just not super familiar with how I, I i'm pretty familiar with joint embedding or somewhat familiar but not super familiar with how generative architecture works so then uh wasn't it didn't quite understand some of that yeah let me see if i've covered this uh let me now kind of go through each of the slides and then we can go deep into generative for the yeah, yeah that's that, that skipped that everything to you know hit on the core idea um yeah, so as you see, right, I think this is kind of the first line from the paper. They categorically mention that this is a non-generative approach, uh, which basically means that uh, first it's self-supervised, um, which means this architecture does not need training data, right? It can self-supervise itself on uh, collection of inputs and responses. Um, so you still need a group input responses, but you just don't need to label them. Um, so that's where the self-supervised idea comes from. The non-generative thing just means that this architecture does not, you know, the neural network is not going to create a response um, that will map to any modality. And by modality, I mean something which is kind of human readable. So like a text, image, audio, uh, things like these. So a generative approach would take your input and map it to a tensor that directly represents one of these modalities. In a non-generative approach, this architecture is going to create this intermediate embedding, which is which we have proved in the paper can be useful for many tasks, like object counting, right? So if you embed using this architecture a lot of images, and then you train a regression model, which takes the abstract representation, so not the generated, you know, it, like the architecture does not generate an image uh, or any consumable modality, it just gives you an embedding. So you can feed that embedding to a second architecture that you train, which can solve downstream tasks. Like it can do depth estimation, it can do um, people content, image classification, other things. So that's where the non-generative thing comes from. Um, in the end, it's an encoder architecture. It's not a decoder architecture. So did, did that help all of it? Um, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I, I'll just move on, right? And uh, the mechanical idea, right, that I picked up from this paper, right? Like, what is the specific um technique that um 
that makes the architecture really powerful is um, is this idea that when they calculate the loss function, when they calculate the loss um, to organize the embedding space, they are trying to predict multiple target blocks in the same image and blocks are just like patches in image, right? So they are trying to predict multiple target blocks in the same image from a single context block, which just means that, um, and I can explain this here, right? So if you have, it's more for right? Not here. Yeah, I think now it's more permanent. So, yeah, the idea here is, let's say this is your input image. Um, you have to divide your image into patches. You pick one patch, uh, map it to the intermediate embedding space. Yeah, map it to the NTA. Map it to the intermediate embedding space. And then you kind of map everything else as well. Uh, right. So let's call that SX or ST. So uh, this is your kind of context and this is your uh, target. So the idea behind the IJPA paper is that you can take a single context block and predict the intermediate representations of multiple target blocks. Okay. So this is kind of, again, a novelty that they bring in their training routine. Only with the intermediate representation of this patch in the image, they're trying to predict every other, I mean, not every other patch, but multiple patches. So now let's move on to the next slide. Uh, do people do this with generative ever? Or generative pretty much only takes a element. Generative models can can take, you can take an element like one block away and it'll try and fill in that patch. But no one is taking a single patch and, gener and filling out an entire image, correct? Okay. Uh, okay. So, I mean, this is, I think just a note, we can skip this. Um, yeah, I think here this snippet would help. Um, so they talk about uh, different techniques, right? So just, so, I mean, just like you mentioned, right? In generative, the key idea is, um, the key idea is, I think that, yeah, they talk about it here. The, the core idea of generative methods is to remove all corrupt portions of the input and learn to predict the corrupted content, right? So exactly what you said. In generative architectures, the thing is you mask out a portion of the image and let the context complete the image, right? Um, and this is kind of related to cognitive learning theories. Again, this is quoted from the paper where they say even in biological systems, the driving mechanism behind representation learning is the adaptation of an internal model to predict sensory input, which is again a complicated way to say the same thing that you don't, um, you know, you only kind of sample from your response set. So you just have Y's, a lot of Y, observed Y's, and then you're trying to correct the Y and ask the architecture to fix it, uh, which is kind of the predicting sensory responses or sensory sense predicting the inputs, right? So yeah, that's the idea behind generative methods. Um, so that's what kind of differentiates. I just just fed up something and, you know, the architecture is not, again, the architecture is non-generative. So, you know, it cannot actually predict the corrupted pixels. It doesn't have the capacity, right? The IJPA only can predict an intermediate embedding. Um, so the second idea behind, uh, yeah, the second idea, the not, 
you know, there is another idea in the non-generative space, which is the joint embedding um, prediction architecture that we talked about. In the joint embedding architecture, what you do is um, you get, you know, you basically sample, let's say, two values from your input set, so the set of X, and um, and then apply some handcrafted data augmentations, like, you know, add some normal error, you know, translate those embeddings, uh, or if you have a labeled set where, you know, the embeddings are, produces, are produced from the same image, in that case, you know, in that case, you're trying to minimize the distance between those two embeddings, right? Um, this is the idea of invariance-based free training, which basically means that if you have prior knowledge that two embeddings are representing the same thing, then you apply a loss function to reorganize the embedding such that your you know bad knowledge kind of maps to the embedding space. Right. Um, so that's the idea behind invariance-based methods. Does this make sense? Yeah. So I think the only reason I'm trying to emphasize that is because um, it's one of the problems that they're trying to address um, and they addressed in the paper was invariance-based methods depend on handcrafted data augmentations so again, they cannot be self-supervised. Uh, you need to tell which two embeddings are coming from the same inputs. Um, and if you do not have labels, then you need the, these handcrafted read augmentation, which is, you know, you scale the image, you crop the image, you jitter the image. The disadvantage of this, and now connecting this to the idea of world models, is, um, I mean, in the YouTube video as well, they talk about how AI needs to understand, you know, multiple modalities, right? Because the concepts are reoccurring in image, sound, and video, etc. So, if these are the only methods we we use to train AI models, then the problem we will run into is random scaling and random cropping and color jittering can be applied to images, but they cannot be applied to sound, right? Um, we know from experience that if you scale the image, it does not change the image. It just makes it look bigger. Um, not the same thing with sound, right? If you change the waveform, make it bigger, it means more amplitude, right? Like it's louder. Um, again, you can't, uh, maybe you can crop, but like color jittering again does not apply to sound. You can't just like jitter the channel senic and say that the same sound is happening. So, yeah, that's another criticism they gave for invariance-based methods that you cannot apply to multiple modalities. It's, it's a very interesting thought. Like, I mean, the way we are able to do in images now, since we are adding audio with modality as well in most cases. So, do we really talk about any aspects where like any data augmentation strategies for audio or is there some other space country? Like somebody else is researching. Yeah, I mean, I haven't checked all the references, but when the paper, they don't talk about audio specific data augmentation and like their, I mean, one of the key advantages behind doing this JEPA architecture is, I mean, they're saying, you know, we shouldn't have handcrafted data augmentation because it will limit you from crossing modalities. And if you cannot, if your AI model cannot cross modalities, then you know, you're, it will have a much smaller world scope, right? It cannot really understand, um, then there is no progress, right? So like joint embedding architectures can already understand relationships between images, between words, between audio. So in order to make progress, we need to kind of drop this handcrafted data augmentations. So in the paper, they yeah, don't talk about any. Thanks. Do you have any thoughts on how this uh, impacts, uh, this can impact video? Because uh, I don't think that I mentioned it in the paper, um, but he mentioned it in the video that it was going to be almost impossible 
either he mentioned it or another person that also talked about IGF on world models talked about how it would be really difficult to get generative video uh, without doing something uh, like this. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I caught that too in the video and the paper they didn't address it. Uh, in the paper, actually, they um, in the related work section, they, uh, I mean, they mentioned a nice thing that, you know, they admit that the paper, the, the, the JEPAR discussion in this paper is primarily focused on images in how neural networks can learn semantics on images and they do not mention uh, how to apply this on audio, video or anything. Uh, but they give a reference to a paper called Data to Vec. Um, and that paper, and they have kind of mentioned in the in the related work section that that's a paper to read if you want to, you know, uh, apply the same idea to multiple modalities. And now to address your question or kind of the video, the reference they made in the YouTube video about training on videos. Um, yeah, I also agree to that, right? Like, the problem with generating videos is that um, the problem with using generative architectures to make videos is that generative architectures are extremely, um, you know, energy-wise, they're really expensive. Not just by energy, I, I definitely mean the number of GPUs you need to train it or to run inference. Also, you need a lot more training data, right? Uh, because videos need to be, um, they need to have continuity. Um, and it's been, it's quite difficult to expect, you know, to get the neural network to solve that problem in the final output space. And in the in the YouTube video, um, you know, the author does mention that JEPA can be really, really useful for the AI to now create videos because in the intermediate embedding space, um, we can, you know, pack a lot of the training data inside these tensors um, come and, the, and the model and the architecture can learn to pack all the knowledge in the training data inside these intermediate embeddings. If it tries to pack that in the final decoded response, um, it's, yeah, from an energy perspective, it's much more expensive. From a training data perspective, it's much more expensive and definitely need, will lead to a lot of training time challenges. Right. Um, yeah. So JPA is also kind of, um, I mean, the author in the YouTube video, they say JPA is a good idea to use if you're trying to create generative video AI models. That. Um, so here, I think uh, I've just captured snippets from the paper. Um, so here they talk about the same thing that um, if you, stick to joint embedding based architectures, you are essentially trying to, um, yeah, you have to handcraft these data augmentations on the embeddings to create more examples from for the architecture to kind of minimize the lo loss on. And if you get into this handcrafted, handcrafted data augmentations, like often multiple downstream tasks on the same modality, do not agree with, th with those invariances. Right, so imagine this means that two things are supposed to be the same. Um, but I mean, this they say that okay, maybe if you do color jittering, image classification, and um, the class the class of the image were shouldn't change if there is minor corruption in the color channels. But again, if you're adding color jittering, you're technically deforming the edges, and deforming edges does not change our idea of what is in the image, but it does change our idea of how to segment objects, right? So these two are like tasks within the same modality that does not conform to the same invariance, right? So again, this is another limitation they talk about for J, you know, joint embedding architectures. Yeah. So, and in the paper, they talk about this framework of looking at neural network architectures as energy-based models, not generally, but within the context of the paper, they are saying the class of architectures that they are talking about, you can best think of them 
within a framework of energy based models um uh, where the incompatible inputs so if you have two samples um for which you have prior knowledge whether they are compatible or incompatible so closely related or not related um if they are not closely related think of the self supervision as trying to force the embedding to uh to have a high energy relationship with those two inputs but if you are inputs you have prior knowledge that they are compatible they have associations of any form you have that prior knowledge then the architecture is supposed to assign a low energy relationship between those two inputs right so again so this is a framework they mention in the paper and they keep referring to it again and again when they talk about other ideas in architectures um and kind of here you see this they say it again that many existing generative and non generative approaches to self supervised learning can be cast in this framework so yeah yeah so again this i already mentioned right so it's not straight forward to generalize you know data augmentations across modality so i hope in the last two slides the key message is that if you if you use joint embedding architectures basically you can't cannot you know it's much better if you have a problem within a modality and very specific task can go for joint embedding but if that's not the space you want to work in you want to cross modalities or cross tasks then you know look further than joint embedding architectures i will leave again i think this is the transition into moving from the joint embedding to the generative architectures and here um i'm just trying to capture the core idea behind generative architectures we already talked about it so i'll move on from here and until unless there is any question all good so hopefully let's move on um again i think we started the call with this so um does this make a lot more sense oliver because i mean you paused me and asked me to go deeper into generative um uh, how are you thinking about these ideas now uh i think so do you mind if i just rephrase this just to see yeah sure um cool so joint embedding architecture would be um taking two inputs or at least during training they would be um taking two uh inputs and then basically encoding them uh in a you would basically determine how close they how similar they are right and then based on that you would have some sort of representation of say uh uh yeah you could you could start to understand um if you do that over and over again you start to understand how all these different things are related in the latent space is that somewhat accurate or accurate cool and then generative architecture uh, at least for training you would take an input image with a mass section and you would try and predict uh the the masks mask section um and that's regardless of you know whether that's uh whether that's audio or video or or any sort of modality um and the key thing here is it's uh it's uh it's going to generate a an embedding that can be directly decoded into the uh the full output yes right and then for joint embedding predictive architecture uh you would take um say one section of an image and you would try and predict the other sections of an image uh based on that yes and just to add, based on that first and yeah and then just the last thing there would be it would be high level and those those outputs would not be directly um those outputs embeddings could not be decoded directly into the human readable format you would need some sort of other model to to output that actually and the if it wasn't 
it'd be interesting to think about um because they talk about blocks of an image uh for multimodal or or for a different modality i'm curious how it would be trained like different chunks of a song you know for example it takes a song and it predi predicts different chunks of an entire three minute song yeah same for video like if let's say you have a like a uh, a clip of video you would have time as a dimension and you would take like a section of multiple images with time and then you would try like that would be one block and you'd maybe have 10 blocks for a video or something then you try and predict the other blocks based based on that like does that high level seem correct yeah absolutely yeah yeah and that's you know, one reason you'll see um, these new Gen AI and video companies, right? Like, so Runway ML, uh, even Stability AI, and now Pika, they only support, I think Pika maybe supports a much longer context length. Um, but at least Runway ML and um, Stability AI, they only support like three seconds of video generation, right? But even that three seconds, uh, you know, if they're generating at 24 FPS, that's like 72 images, right? And and all of these architectures, I mean, by now they're upgraded to using transformers and transformers have positional encodings, right? So transformers can actually predict a sequence and that's why they're in the same family as RNN and LSTMs. So now if you're predicting an image and let's say you break your image into three cross three patches, so nine image, nine crops, or blobs, you're predicting nine. But if you're, you know, not trying to generate a video, if you replace that image with a video, your input is going to be like nine into seventy-two, right? If you're just trying to, what do you mean? So seventy-two counts on the three-second video. Oh, okay. Yeah. So just if you think like that, right? Like you're just replacing the image, which has nine patches, yeah. into nine into FPS in two seconds. So the only thing I was saying for 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 uh, video though is it doesn't, um, like you you can take a chunk of an image and then it's chunked into nine pieces, um, but I would think because the outputs don't need to be translated directly into human, like the whole point is to predict concepts. Um, you could just have the chunks be. Uh, 10 images each or something mm -hmm. or or would that not uh you know like you know what i'm saying um like could you have that rather than saying okay there's nine chunks per image and you know it's 72 images so there's i don't know you know 600 chunks mm -hmm. theoretically you could just chunk it into like groups of 80 and then have that like the input chunk be one group of 80 images with a time parameter and then output the other seven chunks or something like that because it doesn't need to be directly directly translated yeah. back into you know uh into a video does that seem correct yeah 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 and in this so then, theoretically would this be used to extend the length of the video because if you can chunk it into arbitrary amounts, could could you actually chunk like a twenty minute video, or like a one minute video? Yeah, but what you'll have to do in those chunks is like either you go for lower resolution images, or the same thing is for video, right? Um, this the lesser chunks you create, which means you need to capture, you know, the 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 embedding that you're creating for those chunks they need to be decoded into more pixels, right? The fewer chunks, the more pixels connected to every intermediate representation. So, and then the more pixels this intermediate representation needs to back, the more difficult, um, you know, the more training data you will need. Basically, it becomes more challenging, right? For you as the AI trainer and the AI model as well. Okay. But your idea is absolutely the strategy. I think you're spot on, and they, that's like a big advantage of this uh, Jeb architecture. Because if you're using this style of architecture for training your AI model, 
um, you are in this intermediate space, right? So you're not, um, you're taking advantage of this latent input, which could just be some noise or it could be some kind of direction. Let's say, uh, you know, like for an instruction model, this could be your instruction, this could be your input, and this S hat Y could be your target response, right? So in this JEP architecture, you're taking advantage of this concept from generative architectures, and you're taking advantage of the fact that, um, you know, you're not calculating the loss over your full output, but you're calculating the loss over an intermediate representation of your output. Um, so it's going to have an easier time trying to learn that response. Um, could this only be used to predict, um, to take one chunk and then predict the, um, the rest of the chunks, or could it also be used to take like a low resolution chunk and then predict a higher resolution chunk. Uh, um, I guess I'm just wondering, like, theoretically, if you wanted to do, like, a five-minute video, for example, and you could chunk it into, say, five sections of one minute each, um, it could probably have some abstract representations of those five minutes, but then you couldn't just feed that to... You couldn't go straight from the one-minute chunk to... Uh, a video generation model, right? Because it's too big of a chunk. Is there a way to take those one minute chunks and then, you know, split them into 10 second chunks, like a second intermediate layer, for example, or does that not? I see. Yeah. I'm just curious if there's a way to go to yeah. multiple intermediate steps and then to the point where you take a five minute video, you know, a 30 second representation, you can predict a five minute video in smaller chunks and then you kind of recurse, iterative, ultimately get to uh, a level of resolution that you could feed to um, a model like Runway and generate pixels. Mm -hmm. I don't know, I'm just brain, you yeah. know, brainstorming. Yeah, and that's just energy and evolution. Like I'm also, yeah, I, I it just clicked to me, I think, yeah. Theoretically, sounds totally plausible. Um, yeah. Then, yeah. Anyway, just curious. The video stuff is just interesting, you know, or, or like larger. No, I think an idea which came to me was I was doing some time back animal detection. So there, uh, we had video chunks, and then we used to sample frames at different intervals and then pass it to the model. So as you said, like that one minute chunk, also we can sam sample randomly from that. And then iteratively pass it. That could be another way. Okay. Mm. You're uh, sorry. You're saying take multiple. Can be, no. Yeah, there can be sampling strategies at different intervals in that one minute chunk also, and we can get the embeddings and then like average it out or do some operations there again. Could be. Uh, uh -huh. Is singing or not? Yeah, I think it cool. at all would be interesting. So, but that's again like handcrafting, you know, a data augmentation. Um, but totally plausible. And I think we should do like a reference check on the references given in the paper. Um, or yeah, keep a track of like who's citing this paper. And this seems like a yeah, pretty good idea. And that's this is only applicable to, you know, these JEP architectures. You cannot do that with generative architectures and possible with joint embedding for sure. We were just looking, so they have one more from the meta group. They have motion captured JEPA. So there they have I think, used the flow based models and tried to predict for T and T plus free. You see. Interesting. So they already, so that, so this idea they must have referred to in the paper. Yeah. Oh, good. We can, yeah, read that next. So, okay. and let's come on back to the paper. We really should, you know, there's still quite a few slides. So, I don't know. 
Yeah. So I think here in this snippet, um, I mean, they're just talking about this advantage that without prior knowledge, uh, that that being encoded into image transformations, right? Uh, because in the training routine or the method that they have described, you do not, you know, we do not need to transform the images in any particular way. That prior knowledge is not needed. Um, and then they talk about different methods to, you know, still give that sem semantic knowledge to the neural network that if things have this type of noise, it does not change the meaning of the thing, right? Um, so, yeah, and if you compare it to joint embedding architectures where you apply data augmentations and therefore tell the AI model that these two embeddings are representing the same thing uh, under an invariant condition, you know, uh, applied using the data transformation. In in IJAPA, they are trying to um, they are trying to kind of instead of using data augmentation, the idea is the idea they are inheriting maybe from the generative space, but like doubling down on it. So in the generative space, as we talked about, you take a sample response and you kind of cut up a portion of it and then expect the generative model to complete it or remove the corruption. In JEPA, they are breaking down or they are converting every image into patches. And let's say these patches may be overlapping or non-overlapping. And you select one patch, uh, which becomes your context block after and then you kind of run it through your encoder right so you get the intermediate representation of your context patch or block in the image and then using that intermediate representation of just one block in your image the training routine is trying to predict the representations of various target blocks in the image and this way the semantic knowledge that's present in two patches on the same image, they are trying to train the neural network to connect those two things. So, does that make sense? Yeah. You're feeling the thoughts, yeah. Yeah. I'm just trying to contrast it to this uh, idea, right? Because, because now they don't have data augmentation and one advantage of data augmentation is that you're able to tell the model that two things are the same, right? Okay. Um, here, the way they are doing doing it is a bit different where they're picking up two different patches on the image. I mean, not just two, they're sampling multiple patches of the image, selecting one as context, setting the rest as target, and then trying to predict multiple target representations through a single context block. Okay. Hey. Um, so, yeah, go ahead. Just, uh, since you're just predicting on the same image, do they also include the other images when they're doing this thing? No. Matches from other. Yes. So, this only, how will the clustering work out here? Like, uh, uh, won't there be bias in the training set? Like, just what, when we feed in some data which is out of domain distribution, let's say. Yeah, so even given training batch, there are multiple images. Right. Right. So the training routine is like you, let's say you have your architecture, you sample N images. Now for every image, you create, let's say, M batches. One is the context patch, the rest are target. But then, yeah, when you're calculating the loss here, you know, you're calculating over all the, all the N images. Okay. And, um, I mean, this is one statement they make in the paper, which is that um, there is less inductive bias because you're not giving data augmentation. Um, the IJPA is applicable to a wider set of tasks. So, because you're not kind of adding, you know, color jitter or any bias in what invariance means in images, um, the idea is that, okay, that, you know, that that makes it applicable to more tasks, right? Like, so potentially this intermediate representation can solve both people counting 
and depth estimation um, together, right? So this is another kind of statement they make in the paper, which is uh, it's it's scalable and efficient, right? It's definitely scalable than generative architectures. Um, and um, yeah, so I think that's the main statement they are making here that, okay, this is more efficient than generative architectures, right? And it's it's pretty obvious why, because they are predicting in the representation space versus generative architecture are, are predicting in the, you know, the final output space, which tends to be, you know, by definition, which should be higher dimensional than your embedding. So does this make sense? This the synopsis of this slide. They be doing the loss calculation in the embedding space. I'd say. Correct. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. The loss is also in the embedding space. Um, let me actually show one image. Yeah, I think we look at this image, it gives us, I think, a good understanding and then we can go back to the slides. So this is how it works, right? So this is your, this is one of your images in the training set. Um, you're basically selecting one of the blocks. So this is one block, which act as the context. You run it through a transformer architecture. So again, the predictor, the encoder and the target encoder, all three are transformers. Um, so you take the context block, get the intermediate representation, right? And then after applying the mask, the mask is mostly to remove the uh, non-overlapping region, right? So like, um, you know, this this is this is actually part of the red block, right? So this is your target block. Then these two patches are in common, so they are removing it by applying this red mask. So now your context um, only has, you know, intermediate representation for these four blocks. Then you run it through the predictor, and then you get, you know, the predict the semantic the intermediate representation of your of the patch that you want to predict. And uh, remember, it's kind of a non-overlapping, right? So. Yeah, so that's what is happening here. And then um, to get the intermediate representation of your target patch, you also select that patch from here and calculates it, calculate its intermediate representation, right? So this, and this is where you're calculating the N2 loss. So to your question, then, well, as you can see, the loss is being calculated in the, uh, you know, the intermediate embedding space. The one advantage is basically the speed up, right? When you're calculating the loss in the embedding space. Yes. Uh, like any other advantage is like, like in, as compared to like calculating on the images directly. In the yeah, I think, I mean, so one other advantage is, um, you know, you can apply because you're training, uh, because you're training embedding vectors, you can now use them for other tasks. Right. All right. The order models can only generate in the output space, right? So they, you cannot do analytics on your images, or, but right. because you have embedding space, maybe you can use that to do image classification, people counting, other things beyond image reconstruction. I think this kind of aligns with the GAN kind of an architecture where we utilize the embedding space for other tasks. Yeah. Yeah. Encoder, decoder, then. Correct, correct. Yeah. So here, yeah, in GAN, basically, you're applying the loss post the discriminator. Here, yeah, yeah. yeah, we have removed the discriminator altogether and right. yeah, and calculated the, uh, you know, in this intermediate space. Okay. Um, and yeah, here I would just maybe bring your attention to this line where 
you know, they talk about because essentially you now have like three models, idea of a context encoder, predictor, and a target encoder. So they say here the weights of each of these, um, um, yeah, each of these models are updated at each iteration by an exponentially moving average. Uh, yeah, because that sounds weird. So, weights are made out, it is by an exponentially moving average of the context encoder weights. So, yeah, maybe this, I mean, this thing actually I didn't understand quite well. Uh, Somehow the so yeah so I mean what I understand is like the weights are kind of shared between the context encoder and deco and target encoder. Uh, yeah and they are moving like the, the weight updates on the target encoder is a function of the weight updates on the context encoder. So they are not trying to calculate the gradients on this. They are only trying to calculate gradients on this and this. And then as the uh, weight updates are applied on the context encoder, they are using exponential moving average to update the weights on the target encoder. So just, you know, just, uh, I think important note, but it's just given here in the paper. Then. Hey, Oliver, does that kind of make sense? Um, somewhat. Yeah. I think this is again an implementation trick. Um, yeah, it's, I can. This saves them, I mean, this saves the, tra this reduces the training time because you're only calculating weight updates on two models and the third model, you know, the weight updates on the third model is a function of this. So your optimizer will run faster, right? From an engineering perspective, that's kind of the key thing. Um, let's see. Yeah. So here again, I think they do, they do a good job of visually presenting the idea. So this is your original image in your unsupervised training data, right? Or unable training data. And this is the context, you know, the patches that they have selected. And these are different targets. As you can see, uh, I think, yeah, I think in this case, the targets are overlapping. Like this target and this target is overlapping, but the context and target are non overlapping as much as I can see it. Um, and the loss is simply the average edge distance between the predicted patch level representations and the target patch level representation. So they are taking the context, running it through the encoder. Um, so this is kind of your encoder, right? So they are taking the context, running it through the encoder, getting the intermediate output, intermediate representation. And then as they are saying, uh, then for each of the target patches as well, they create an intermediate representation. And uh, then they kind of take both the, and they take the average L2 distance between multiple intermediate representations for each of these targets and uh, the intermediate representation of from the context. And then they just, yeah, take the average and two distance and calculate and do a weight update, you know, I do a weight update on uh, this once encoder model and after, and, and as well as take weight updates on the predictor model. And what they say over here is, you know, the weights of the target encoder is updated at every iteration, which means every batch, I'm guessing. And uh, it is just an exponential moving average of the weight updates that they get on this form.
I hope I was somehow able to explain. I think this this aspect. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Why? Yeah. So if you look at the training code for this, I I think then this slide will be really helpful to relate. Um, because, yeah, yeah I mean the law. Basically, they have used a very simple loss function, right? Like, you can't go wrong with implementing this. Um. Yeah, I think so. That's. Yeah, I think that to me was like that, you know, quick summary of the paper. Um, there is a method section as well, which goes into more details, but essentially uh, that I've skipped, I've not picked up any notes from the method section because the method section basically describes this figure and this, right? So how do, how, what's the strategy to pick, you know, how, what is the strategy to create these patches? What is the strategy to pick these blocks, whether for context or for target? And then what's the technique, you know, to calculate the semantic implementations and applying the loss. So that's all covered in the method section. I think if we review that, we'll get more details. Um, and as a final note, I picked this snippet as well, where they talk about uh, the data to work method, um, where as you can see here, right, this, I think that this, reading this now makes this line make a lot more sense because uh, even in the data to work paper, they are, um, the target encoder is being updated in an online fashion, right? Uh, it's not just coming from the, I mean, not, the updates to the target encoder is not coming from the optimizer. In the JEPA paper, it's coming from the weight updates applied on the decode on the context encoder. Um, again, I haven't read the data to web paper completely, so I do not know what is their online strategy, but that's one thing that data to web and JEPA share. And um, they also mentioned that the data to web paper um, avoids augmentations and therefore um, they are able to apply it to more modalities that are able to apply the data to work are better on vision, text, and speech and get good results. So that's my final slide. Uh, I hope that was a good review. Any thoughts, questions? Yeah, I think I like the idea of like how they're moving away from on handcrafting augmentations to and just utilizing the patches in the image that's one take, big takeaway really. and mm. uh, working in the embedding space is more useful than directly uh, the generative and that stark distinction between generative embeddings and the joint embedding uh, space yeah I like these two ideas strongly for me that yeah like yeah looking forward like we I'm going to discuss the data to wake in the next reading. That curious to read mode. Yeah, I think one paper that yeah, I shouldn't, we should check out that flow uh, sounds to yeah, me. Yeah, data to wake. Yeah. What is it? I'll share that with this part. Yeah. yeah. Motion capture using Jim. Uh, that's uh, w what's the paper called? Uh, MC Jepa. MC Jepa. Okay, that's cool. Yeah, I think it makes a lot more sense why they only talk about images because it's called iJEPA. But I think they, they have, there are separate papers where they've applied the JEPA idea to different modalities. So, mm -hmm. yeah, Oliver, any thoughts from you? Uh, no, I thought this was great. It would be great to do another one. Yeah, so let's let's take a quick board. I think uh, should we do motion Jepa or should we do data to work? Um, I don't have a strong. Go ahead. I don't know. Have a strong preference. Let's do. I mean, my my preference would be motion Jepa because I think now I understand the Jepa idea. So quickly going through very related papers might be easier. 